Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Browser channel. Today, as this video gets posted, it is almost Father's Day 2024. And I thought it's been a long time since I've done a topical post. Something involved in the holidays and whatnot that we're celebrating at this time. And being a father myself, I thought, yeah, let's do this. So fathers are kind of lacking in respect these days. You have a lot of shows and commercials where dads are portrayed as kind of uh, bumbling and clueless. And it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. And you talk a lot about deadbeat dads, but most dads are not deadbeats. They're there for their kids. They're, they're heroes in their own way. And so I was thinking, certainly there has to be a lot about dads in steampunk as a fictional genre. So I went over my huge list of the books I've read and I found a number of examples that I thought would be interesting and relevant to talk about in today's show. Steampunk is often an adventure genre and when it's not an adventure genre it's a romance genre and therefore you don't always have a lot about families in it. Uh, the exception is some of the YAs. Some of the YAs have you know, family dynamics. Though you often see it where the protagonist is an orphan. <laughs> so, but, yeah, there are a number of good examples. And I created this list of fictional steampunk dads that kind of ran the gamut from very bad fathers to very good fathers. And, unfortunately, it's a little skewed towards bad fathers because... Fiction depends on conflict and struggle, and therefore, you know, if you have a perfect dad, what is there to be struggling about? <laughs> but on the other hand, if he's a if he's a piece of, of garbage, well, there you have your, your struggle. Some of these examples, I'm going to try to only give one or two examples of each, because there are several, there are several good possibilities. And I'm going to draw on a couple of my own works. Uh, one which I wrote on my own, and the other two which I wrote in conjunction with Mrs. Desperado, uh, Arliss Holloway, my wonderful better half. And so we're going to blow our own horn a little bit this time. Now, fathers can play many roles in fiction, and steampunk is no exception. And I'm going to start with the bad ones so that I can end on a positive note. <laughs> and out of the worst, of the worst of the worst, I think, are the manipulators. Not the deadbeats, because at least they're not doing any harm. But the manipulators, they're the ones who actually, you might think that they're being nurturing, but they actually have this nefarious purpose. Their kids are going to be part of their schemes, and be pawns in the game, etc., etc., which I think is pretty negative. A very good example is a very recent book. Uh, called Babel, or The Necessity of Violence, The Arcane History of the Oxford Translators' Revolution. <laughs> That's a mouthful, by R.F. Quang. Now, I have a mixed feelings about this book, uh, but it's a very perfect example for this, because the anti-hero, or the antagonist, is Professor Lovell from Oxford. In this world, magic depends a lot on translation of languages. It's the most powerful sort of magic. And so he's in the Oxford Linguistics Department, which is a very powerful department. He wants more Chinese speakers. But China's kind of closed off in this, this world. So he goes to China and he fathers a child in China. Because <laughs> his idea is, I want somebody who's a native speaker in both languages. So does he stay in China to raise the kid? No, he goes back to England, although he sends you know, money and hires a tutor for this kid back in China and eventually sends for him when he's ready to go to college. Now, the kid renames himself Robin Swift because his own name is unpronounceable and he wants to fit in better with... That doesn't really work, though, very well in this in this fictional England. But anyway, he discovers that his father really only wanted him as a pawn, as somebody with the right magical abilities to further his schemes. And in fact, he has a half-brother, also half-Chinese, whom his father discarded and disowned when he didn't want to be part of those schemes. 
So it's it's a very negative view of fathers, but an important and powerful one. It's just that to me it was a little overdone. <laughs> Another example from a book, and this is one of my favorite books uh, by contrast, is Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern, in which two powerful magicians, and this is real magic, <laughs> these two powerful magi magicians, they each adopt a child with promising talent. And they're kind of grooming them to be even more powerful than they are. Unfortunately, the kids don't know that they're being groomed as a rivalry. <clears throat> they're, they're supposed to fight to the death with their counterpart at some point. Well, it so happens that they're, they're a boy and a girl and they fall in love. So here's the conflict. And terrible dads, terrible adoptive dads. The next category is the more vanilla category of the deadbeat, <laughs> who uh, fathers the child and splits. And this doesn't occur a lot in fiction because it's kind of boring. You know, he's not there. But here's an example that sprang to mind. Now, Shelley Adina has a great YA series called Magnificent Devices. Unfortunately, most of the dads in this series are kind of bad. And one in particular is the man, uh, he was an aeronaut, he was a foreigner, came into England, uh, hooked up with a local lady, fathered a child, and split! <laughs> the young man, his last name is Terwilliger, so they actually did marry, but they call him Tig, I can't remember his first name, but he's a little bitter because his father kind of, his father abandoned him and his mother, and so he makes something of himself. He becomes an aeronaut on his own right. And the father comes back eventually and says, Hey, son, sorry I abandoned you. Please forgive me. And Tig kind of says, I don't know. <laughs> he left him with a tough, tough road. And so it's kind of poignant in that way. Example or category number three, the loser dad, the negative role model. The best one I can think of comes from Bone Shaker by Sherry Priest. Now, the dad in question is Leviticus Blue. He, he doesn't even appear in the story. He was an inventor who disappeared. He invented this mining machine. He was demonstrating it in the city of Seattle. And it went amok and, and uh, cut through the Earth's crust and rendered the city uninhabitable, basically. And so he was reviled and he disappeared. Now, poor Zeke is his son and he wants to try to reclaim his father's image, saying, at least, well, my father didn't mean to do this. You know, he had the best intentions. So he goes into the dangerous city of Seattle uh, and risking his life for this. And his mother has to come after him. <laughs> but it's, it's an important, you know, father-son dynamic, even if the father isn't there. Next category is one that's kind of rare, but it's fun. This is the overachiever that the son can't possibly measure up to. Kid Jeter wrote a series that begins with Infernal Devices, which was published back in the 1990s, I believe. A very uh, kind of dark but funny book about a guy named George Dower, whose genius father recently died and left him the family business. He was an inventor, a clockwork designer, and repairman, and it turns out that Dower is kind of a nitwit. He has no talent whatsoever, and he has to suffer by people thinking he'd have the talent and he doesn't and his business is going belly up because of it not only that but his father invented certain things that went haywire that went amok and now he's expected to pay the damages poor george next one is very common uh, almost a trope in steampunk traditionalist dad this is the dad who does care but the problem is he doesn't understand he wants the kid to be a traditional, you know, hardworking, keep your nose clean, keep your head down type of citizen. And the kid, no, I want to be an inventor or an explorer or whatnot. Usually the protagonist is a girl because, you know, in Victorian society, girls weren't supposed to be explorers. They weren't supposed to be inventors. And the best example, again, comes from Shelley Adina's Magnificent Devices series. This is the titular character, the lady of devices herself, Claire Trevelyan. Her parents, and especially her father, did not want her to become an engineer. She's supposed to marry a fellow aristocrat and be mother to lots of children. And, you know, be the homemaker uh, type of society matron. Well, no. 
Clary doesn't want that. She has a different goal in mind, and she does her own thing despite her parents' desires. I have an example from my own work. In this case, it's a man. Fidelio's Automata, the hero Fidelio Espinosa, is a brilliant young Cuban inventor. He wants to become a famous inventor and work with Thomas Edison in America. His father says, no, stay here in Cuba and become my heir to the family business. And he says, sorry, Dad, can't do that, and goes his own way. So again, he has to struggle with that you know, lack of connection with his father. Uh, so we have the complicated relationship. There's a very great series called Vampire Empire by Clay and Susan Griffith. It's kind of romantic, supernatural steampunk in which vampires uh, take over Europe and Britain and kind of make humans into their slaves, their, their livestock, so to speak. And the, the rebel here is Prince Gareth. He is the Prince of Scotland. He is a vampire, but he is sick of being a parasite. He wants to live on equal terms with humans. And so his father was the vampire king of Britain, but he wasn't an enti entirely bad guy. He kind of inspired, inspired Gareth because he wasn't uh, needlessly cruel. He tried to treat the humans well, even though they had to feed off of them, which was very unlike most of the other high-level vampires. So it's a very sad relationship as his father has become, he's like 300 and he's senile. It's, it's kind of a sad <laughs> uh, relationship, especially because he has a manipulative, cruel brother who kind of takes over and poisons the well. Next, the eccentric dad. <laughs> and my favorite example of this comes from a kid's book. This was one of my favorites as a child. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Yes, it's that book. And it was made in a movie, but it was written by Ian Fleming, the guy who did James Bond. Well, he also did this one kid's book for his own kids. So good dad there. And in this book, Commander Pot is an inventor who buys this one-of-a-kind car, renovates it, and discovers it's got some pretty amazing properties. And he takes his family along for the ride. For these adventures now he's kind of putting his family at risk but he's fun <laughs> so i see him as the uh, prototypical eccentric dad the next category inspirational dads and in this case the dad isn't even there he has died but he inspires the protagonist to be something this is scott westerfeld's leviathan series in which darren sharp she's a teenage girl in britain her father was a famous aeronaut who died aeronauting. <laughs> and she wants to be an aeronaut too. She wants to join the Royal Air Corps, but she can't because she's a girl. She has to impersonate a boy. So she is one of the main characters and, and it's her struggle. So she's not struggling with him so, so much as she's going to actually model herself on him even though her society doesn't want her to. Next, we have the supportive or positive role model dad. What springs to mind immediately is the Baron von Monocle series, another YA, in this case by John Della Rose. And the heroine is Zara von Monocle. She's inherited her father's title. He was an explorer, and she's kind of modeling herself after him, again, an inspiration, but he is thought dead, uh, and he comes back. But he supports her. He supports her adventuring, which is very unusual for this time and place. So I see him as the positive role model because he is a good guy. He's a stand-up guy. He's a hero in his own way. Again, my own series, that is in conjunction with Mrs. Desperado, we have two books in this series so far. First is Miss IOD in the Mayan Marvel. The second is Professor IOD and the Epicurean Incident. In this case, IOD is a young woman uh, of uh, American British kind of descent and she wants to become an explorer, a writer, a traveler and she's a scientist and researcher and it's not something that women are supposed to do in her time in the late 1890s, early 1900s. But her father does support her. He is very supportive. 
And the mother, on the other hand, she's a little leery of this, but she does, you know, tolerate it. So I see him as one of the good dads. Next category, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call this the doting dad. He's almost too good to his kids, and he kind of pays a price because of that. My example here is, again, one of my favorite books. It's by Neil Stevenson. It's called The Diamond Age. This is the only book I can think of that is both steampunk and cyberpunk at the same time. It's a little complicated to explain that, but it is. The subtitle of this book is A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer, which is essentially what the book is about. The titular primer is kind of a textbook. It's an interactive game. It's something that's supposed to be both fun and educational, and it's designed to educate a young girl so she can be a totally well-rounded and intellectual and uh, smart, uh, self-assertive person, including self-defense. It teaches all these things. The irony of this is that the man who commissions the book is this lord, he's this wealthy lord, in this very stuffy new Victorian society that has gone back to their roots. This is kind of the steampunk aspect of it. But this lord commissions this book for his granddaughter because he thinks, I want my granddaughter to be able to think outside the box. I don't want her to be, you know, just a wife and mother, that sort of thing. So he hires this engineer named John Hackworth. Now Hackworth puts his heart into this book and he says, even though the contract forbids it, I want a copy for my daughter. So he steals a copy and he pays a great personal price because he gets caught. But worse still, he doesn't even get it to his daughter because somebody else steals that copy from him. A young hooligan swipes this and gives it to his sister, who really needs it. I mean, their father is a criminal who is executed. He was a pretty bad guy. Uh, their mother is kind of a worthless layabout. And they really have no direction. So young Nell... It makes her assertive, it makes her intelligent, it makes her strong, and she becomes a leader, you know, kind of a, a folk hero, because this book allows her to do that. And so here's a story where a dad was almost too good to his kids and ended up benefiting somebody else's kid. And nonetheless, it's almost like she's a foster child. It's almost like she has been adopted by uh, John Hackworth without his knowledge. Final category is my favorite because it's the most inspiring. It is the hero dad, the dad who rescues his kids from peril. And it's like Arliss, Mrs. Desperado, always says whenever we're watching a movie and she says, uh oh, it's child in danger. <laughs> it's something that's guaranteed to move the audience emotionally. And so is the case with these books. First example, Langdon St. Ives. He's a major character in. Uh, James Blaylock's Narbondo series. Why he named it after the villain, I'm not sure, but Dr. Narbondo is this evil hunchback. <laughs> and in one of the books, he kidnaps Langdon's young son, and he has to rescue the son. Very inspiring. Very heroic dad. And, you know, very dangerous. Narbondo is a dangerous man. And I've saved the final illustration of this heroic dad principle is by a fellow I personally have met, a, a writer from the Southwest here. His name is David Lee Summers. He's an astronomer by night and a writer by day. And he has this wonderful series called Clockwork Legion. It's a steampunk American West. And what has changed history here is that these aliens came in and behind the scenes they kind of started manipulating things, giving certain countries technology because they want to unite the human race. Well, it kind of went bad. <laughs> but the protagonist, the main protagonist, is Ramon Morales, and he is a sheriff from New Mexico. He has become a diplomat. He is trying to stop wars. He's working with the U.S. government, and he's kind of interfacing with the aliens, telling them, please butt out of our affairs. <laughs> but anyway, he has this relationship with his, his wife, who is also helping with that, and his young daughter who gets kidnapped by the sinister forces and he has to rescue her and so therefore he is again a hero dad. This has been my rather extemporaneous look at fathers 
in the steampunk subgenre. Let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Please like and subscribe. And also check out our works on Amazon. The links are in the description. You can find those books I mentioned there in ebook or physical book form. For now, this is Steampunk Death Row saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Death Row channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.